I'm very honored to uh, be here introducing a panel of representatives of three of the largest health plans um, uh, serving the state of California. Um, we'll be hearing from Paul Markovich, the CEO of Blue Shield of California. We'll be hearing from Aldo De La Torre, who's the Vice President of Provider Engagement um, for Anthem Blue Cross. And we'll be hearing from Stephen Sell, who is the President of HealthNet of California. Now, these organizations, as, as you know, you know, collectively represent uh, literally thousands and thousands of the employers who every month write premium checks that uh, eventually end up paying for health care for our patients. They also represent literally millions upon millions of individual patients who are also writing checks for co-pays, co-insurance, deductibles, and so on. So as we think about the triple aim um, and how to collaborate effectively in that direction, um, the triple aim is a very complicated set of goals, um, sometimes conflicting goals, sometimes um, goals that, that uh, work well together. And we can expect that there, are, that there will be a lot of variety and opinions on how best to uh, accomplish those goals. Um, and we can expect that there will be a lot of debate. However, um, those of us who are parents uh, would at, at least like to believe that the people who end up writing those checks um, have opinions that are at least a little bit on the special side. So um, I'm very interested and um, very excited to hear the perspectives of, of these um, persons who are representing those interests of the check writers for healthcare today. So um, with that, let's move forward and, and uh, we'll, we'll hear first from Paul. Oh. Paul Markovich, uh, President and CEO of Blue Shield of California. Thank you very much for having me here today. Um, I was, uh, as I was putting together a few slides for the discussion today, a story came to mind I wanted to share that I thought was appropriate, particularly for us. Um, I was around 10 years old growing up, and my, I was a decent swimmer, so my parents decided to put me into this really uh, kind of intense, rigorous swimming class uh, that lasted several months and ended with a, a test that had a really high failure rate of the kids that went through it. And I was the youngest in the group, and I showed up, and after the first session, uh, we had this uh, female drill instructor who was effectively our, our coach giving us the lessons, she just started to continuously critique me. Uh, almost every time I got in the pool, it was a constant, all the things I was doing wrong, all the things I needed to correct. And in my perception, and actually my parents as well, disproportionately focused on me. So I kept going back home, kind of down after every one of these swim practices, um, wondering why it was that the instructor disliked me so much. Um, and by the time we got around to the end of the session and I had to go for this test, I thought, why did I even bother showing up? Uh, and when it was done, of the dozen students that went through it, I ended up being the only one that passed. And uh, you know, this almost militant drill instructor coach came up to me and put her arm around me and told her, congratulated me and said how proud she was of me. And I couldn't speak. I didn't, couldn't figure out what was going on. I went home with my parents and I said, I don't get it. <laughs> right? uh, she was carping at me for three months. Now she likes me? What happened? And uh, that was my parents. It was kind of like a leave it to beaver episode, right, with the moral of the story at the end of it. Describe tough love. It's like, no, you know, there's times your fiercest critic is actually your fiercest critic because of how much they care about you and because of how much they believe in you because they see potential in you. And that was a striking story. I, I remember it to this day, and I have experienced it again in sports. I've experienced it in business, that um, that can very much be the case. And I thought it was appropriate for, as an analogy, given a number of things. First of all, when you look at the affordability crisis I'm about to describe and health reform, we are, as an industry, about to go through a test every bit as daunting as that swimming test I went through. And there will be a high failure rate. And last year, in case any of you didn't notice, um, we had quite a negotiation uh, with, between Blue Shield 
and your medical centers. And I was, in fact, critical of UC at that time. Uh, and I believe then, and I believe even more so now, the more I have talked to you folks, the more I hear Mark give presentations like the one he gave this morning, uh, that you all, with our help, and with, I'm sure, a lot of change, uh, are going to be able to pass this test with flying colors. So what I wanted to really talk about beyond swimming lessons um, was several things. We have an affordability crisis. It is by far our, our biggest challenge and priority. We can solve it. What we need is will and skill and cooperation. So why is affordability our top challenge? We talk about the triple aim. I'm going to use two triple aims here. Um, affordability is the most important, I think, out of clinical quality and patient satisfaction and cost because it's not sustainable. And you'll see why in a moment. Whereas, well, it's incredibly important to improve quality and the patient experience, and I'm passionate about that, I wouldn't argue that those are on unsustainable paths, whereas cost clearly is. Fortunately, we need to improve quality in order to improve affordability. So I do not see any tension whatsoever between those goals. And while I look at your own, I know you don't call it a triple aim, but when you look at your mission of saying you're going to treat patients well, you're going to train the physicians of the future, you're going to do world-class research that has an impact on the healthcare system, you're going to do all three of those things, the training of physicians and the research you're doing is under threat if we cannot make healthcare, the treatment of patients affordable. And so for all those reasons, affordability is really what allows us to keep pursuing both of these triple aims. Here's what I mean by it not being sustainable. This is data from 2009. Okay, at that point, uh, it cost less to hire a software engineer in India than it did to pay for the health benefits of a software engineer in Silicon Valley. Uh, it cost Safeway twice as much every quarter to pay for health benefits as it did, it, they paid twice as much for health benefits as they earned in income every quarter. And Starbucks paid as much for coffee beans as they paid for health benefits. And you certainly don't need me to tell, me, tell you about the challenges that the autos have had in terms of affordability. This is the group that's most likely able to afford health care, and that's the situation that they're in. If you look at the government, I'm sure you uh, probably got the memo on this. We're not in great fiscal condition in, uh, federally or in the state of California. Um, you've probably been pinched almost as much as anybody has in, in terms of the state's funding. But just take a look at this for a minute. Currently, the entire federal budget takes up about 20% of gross domestic product or 20% of the economy. Within 60 years, status quo, Medicare and Medicaid alone will take up that much of the gross domestic product if nothing changes. And so the idea that we're just going to keep going where we're going uh, and be able to afford it clearly isn't going to happen. Consumers can't afford it either. This is how much of the last decade or so the blue line is how much health premiums have gone up. The green line is how much wages have gone up. Uh, and, and currently, if you look at the total all-in cost of health care, like what Blue Shield offers and median income, it takes up, it takes the average family of four in California, over 25% of their gross income is what a health care policy costs for that family of four. And it's rising. Okay. So my point of all this is to say that the money just is not there to pay for trends that we have been experiencing up until this point. It is not sustainable, right? What drives it? Well, the biggest driver by far, and this, these are facts, this is not a value statement, in terms of Blue Shield's contracted rates on a statewide basis in 2000, an acute inpatient bed day cost around $1,875. Apples to apples, 2012, it's over $6,600. Um, and which means that you can pay for the, a family of four, five months of food for a family of four, you could put that family of four up in a suite in the Beverly Wilshire Hotel uh, for a week, or they can spend one night in a hospital at Blue Shield's contracted rate on average. 
Um, and that is the biggest reason premiums have gone up as much as they have. Now, there's very good reasons for that, and we all know them. I just want to make sure you know that I know them, okay? Because what happens right now is you're treating the uninsured, and you can't squeeze blood out of a rock, right? So you lose huge sums of money as hospitals on the uninsured. You lose money on Medi-Cal, which keeps ratcheting reimbursement down. We lose money on Medicare, generally speaking, because they've been ratcheting reimbursement down. You've got seismic retrofitting, nurse staffing ratios. Of course, you've got to figure out how to train all these folks if you're an academic medical center. And the only place you have to go negotiate is with the folks up here at the table, all right? Which you do, and you make a, pretty much all of your profit in that one place. And then hospitals, on average, make a little less than 4%. So we, all, we can explain this. Right? We all can explain why it's the case, but in many respects, it's like trying to explain to someone who makes minimum wage why a Ferrari costs so much money. Okay? It, it's interesting, and it's not very relevant if they can't afford it. And I'm not suggesting for a moment, I'm not comparing UC to a Ferrari. Please don't misunderstand. My point here was just to say, look, if somebody can't afford it, if the money's not there, then explaining why it costs so much is not going to help them afford it. Our job is to figure out collectively how to make this financially sustainable for all of you and for all of us at much lower revenue trend rates so that it is affordable to them, right? Now, one of the other things that pops up in these conversations is, well, we're worth it because we're higher quality, just generally. Again, this is not a UC-specific thing. These are all our hospitals plotted on a relative cost, case mix, severity adjusted basis, and a relative quality basis. And there is a prize for anyone that can find a relationship between these two things. There's a lot of scientists out here, I know, a lot of people that would probably know math pretty well. We've yet to be able to find a connection between the two. So as we looked at this, we said, okay, fine, that's the picture, you understand it, we understand it, that's our challenge. Um, what do we do about it? And what's clear, and this is not, I think, unique to Blue Shield, but what is clear is traditional methods won't solve this crisis. If we stay in the same working relationship as we've had in the past, it's not going to work. We've taken a look at this. We've benchmarked the country, we've benchmarked the state, and said, okay, if we just were the best of the best at all these different things, what would happen to our price within, you know, 10 years' time? And it turns out, our prices would double about a year later than they otherwise would. So instead of doubling in eight years, they'd double in seven years. Okay? That does not help us out. We need to break out of that box, think differently, work differently, be far more collaborative if this is going to work. So as I said at the beginning, we need will and skill. Will meaning it's a priority for all of us to say, and it's our top priority, to figure out how to make the system affordable and apply that everywhere. How do we train physicians in a way that's less expensive and highly effective? How is it that we do research that really helps drive affordability in the system and make that a priority, right? Um, skill, there's a whole bunch of things we need to do. This is not an exhaustive list, but pooling a large statistically significant population in a concentrated geographic area, figuring out how to forecast what they're going to cost, and then finally being able to mobilize and manage that population in a way that lowers the cost are the key skills that are going to be required. This is my last slide. Um, this is one of the main reasons I said at the beginning how excited I am and how convinced I am that we're, uh, you and we are ready to work together in a way to solve this issue, which is we have our, we're already doing it. Last year, the city and county of San Francisco which has been experiencing high single-digit, low double-digit premium trends for as, about as far as the eye can see, we sat down and said, we're going to change that. We're going to work together with UCSF, with Hill Physicians, with Dignity Health. In this area, we're going to take that population and we're going to make the healthcare trend 0% for that group, 0%. In total, we saved about $10 million for the city and county of San Francisco, over a million of that just with this what we call ACO, but we sat down, worked together, figured out a number of interventions, and hit it. And this is the way, I think, whether it's this way or different alternatives, setting this up, lining up our incentives, figuring out how to work together much more closely, 
whether it's with Blue Shield or another health plan, I think is the way that we're going to try and solve this affordability crisis and, uh, and pass our swim test. So with that, I thank you.